Well, again, it is great to be with you this morning. I'm so thankful uh, to have the opportunity to be with you and pray that we can find some encouragement for our lives this morning. We're continuing on looking together at one of the most encouraging and positive books in all the New Testament, the letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians. It's a small New Testament book. It's tucked kind of in the middle of the New Testament. I've been encouraging you, if you're looking for something to read over the next few weeks, you know, for your own personal devotions, Ephesians makes a great devotional read. Uh, you will be encouraged and, and sometimes challenged, but mostly encouraged by the positive counsel of the Apostle Paul to his friends at Ephesus. We've been talking about checking our baggage. You know, many of us carry some baggage, not because we're worse sinners than anybody else, it's just because the stuff of life weighs us down sometimes. And it can be hard to check that baggage into Christ even though we need His help. So, so over the next few weeks, we've been encouraging one another to check the baggage that we need to the, one, the only one who can really handle it properly, and that is our Lord. Last couple of weeks we looked at the baggage of lingering loneliness and deathly desires and this morning we're looking at a at a heavy bag that many of us do carry around the baggage of a painful past and my prayer for us is that we'll be able to lay some of that down at the feet of Christ this morning that whatever whatever's haunting you from your past you can let go of perhaps this morning maybe for the first time in a long time as we look together at the positive counsel of Ephesians. We're, we're, we're looking at Ephesians partly because it's so encouraging. Ephesians was written really to encourage Christians. And the encouragement that Paul gives to these friends of his in Ephesus is sort of outstanding in, in many ways, but especially when you consider the context in which Ephesians was written. We talked last week from, about the fact that Ephesians was written by Paul from prison. Most scholars believe that Paul was imprisoned probably in Rome when he wrote this letter to his friends. Imprisoned in Rome when he wrote the other letter uh, of, of the, to the Philippians in the New Testament. So it's amazing that this letter takes on such a positive tone. Imagine, you know, being chained literally by a three or four, you know, foot length of chain to a Roman guard while you're writing this letter, trying to keep your own spirits up and encourage somebody else. That must have been really challenging. Except that Paul knew the Spirit of the Lord. He knew the courage that comes from following Christ. And, and, I, and I want to take a moment just to talk about that word encouragement. Because I think sometimes we confuse that with something else. Especially as Christians. Especially in the church. To encourage someone is to fill them with courage. To be encouraged is to find courage again for your life and for your future, whatever it might be. Now, that's a little different than some of the things we sometimes pray for as Christians. And I, Listen, I'm not saying that uh, it's wrong to pray that God will change your circumstances. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray that God will change your situation. God is the God of miracles. God can do anything God wants to do. And I would never say that you're wrong in praying that. But I think what we need to see here this morning is that sometimes our circumstances don't change. But what we find is courage to live in and through them as victorious people. Even when the circumstance, even when the situation may not change. That's courage. You see, biblical courage does not mean that I believe every single thing is going to go exactly the way I want it to in the future. When I pray, to, have in, to find encouragement when I pray does not mean that I believe that God's going to answer my prayer exactly the way I think God ought to answer that prayer. To, to, to be encouraged, I, I think in the biblical sense, is to know and to find the courage that I need to know that I can face whatever the future holds because the Lord of the universe is going with me and is going to stay with me and care for me and love me through whatever it is that may be you know, looming out there next, right? I think that's courage. To find courage not to believe that, you know, some grandiose plan that, that everything is going to go exactly the way I want it to go, but to know that even through the, the, the failures and the fears and the doubts and the missteps and all that stuff that the future's bound to hold, I'm going to make it because Christ is going with me. And I can find courage in that kind of faith. And so the Apostle Paul, 
might have prayed that his situation would change. I mean, I'm sure if he could have just changed his situation, he probably didn't care about being in prison. I mean, he probably didn't want to be there. I mean, who would want to be in prison in Rome, right? But, but instead of, of spending all the letter talking about, oh, you know, pray for me, I sure hope this situation will change. And, and I've been praying every day that my situation and my circumstance would change because I just hate being right here where I am. You don't hear that from him. What you hear is this tremendous sense of courage that Paul has deep in his soul because he knows whatever tomorrow brings, God is going to be right there with him, even if it's in a Roman prison chained to a Roman guard. Uh, I, I, I think that's biblical courage, the kind of courage that you and I need. Well, in Ephesians chapter 3 that we're going to read this morning, uh, I, there's another insight into this I think is pretty important. This is important to me when I read this in preparation for doing this study of Ephesians. I caught something, a, a phrase that Paul uses in this, the body of this text we're getting ready to read, that leads me to believe that perhaps Paul had some of his own baggage that he carried around with him. I think it's possible. So listen for that as we read from Ephesians chapter 3, starting with the first verse. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words the reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. As a church that's comprised of 99.9% Gentiles, you ought to be shouting hallelujah right now, right? Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of His power. Although, I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, you caught that passage, perhaps. I slowed down a little in the reading when we got to verse 8. When the Apostle Paul, in this tremendously encouraging passage, it's almost as if for a second he gets haunted by something and he slows down all of the, the encouragement that he's just pouring upon the church and suddenly he remembers something. And he refers to himself as the very least of all the apostles. Did you catch that in verse 8? That is not unique to Ephesians. In fact, if you've read the other letters of Paul in the New Testament, you know that those kinds of phrases of self-abasement are pretty common from Paul. He often refers to himself as the least of all the apostles. In one of his letters, he calls himself one untimely born. Think about that. I'm the least of the, as one untimely born. If he meant that, that's a pretty big deal. To think that even your birth was a mistake? That somehow God got it wrong and you were born in the wrong time and place? I don't know if that's exactly what he's saying, but if he meant anything even close to that, that's pretty strong stuff. Evidently, the Apostle Paul was himself haunted from time to time by his past. Do you remember his story? Uh, we, we read about him in the book of Acts, a brief recap. His name was Saul originally, named after King Saul, great name. He had a great career ahead of him when he was 20, 21 years old. He had a lot of promise, was given a lot of, a lot of authority, apparently, by the religious leaders for a young man that age, and was going around persecuting the church. 
and even imprisoning people from the synagogue. Do you remember the stories? And as a persecutor of the church, evidently, he had a hard time letting go of his past and some of the things that he had done. No denying it. He wished probably that he could go back and maybe redo it with the new knowledge that he has, but he can't. It's still there. How many of you have seen the movie, The Apostle Paul? Uh, I didn't have an opportunity to see that, so I'm going to talk about something just from, you know, third-hand knowledge, but, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand in the movie, they show the Apostle Paul often reflecting back and being sort of haunted by these images of people that he once persecuted before he became a Christian. I think that's probably accurate. I think as we read the New Testament, that probably did haunt the Apostle Paul often. He was a new, a new creation in Christ. He was a powerful uh, a pastor and speaker and missionary. If not for the Apostle Paul, you and I probably wouldn't be here today. That's true. Well, maybe God would have found somebody else. I don't know. But without the Apostle Paul's ministry, you and I would probably not be sitting in a church this morning 2,000 years later. And yet, the Apostle Paul apparently had some of his own baggage that he carried around from the past. So let me ask you this morning, how about you? Are you lugging around some heavy baggage from the past? It might look different than the Apostle Paul's baggage, but every once in a while, and sometimes maybe even, sometimes things, you know, bubble up from my past that haunt me at weird times. Anybody ever had that experience? I mean, you're humming along, things are going great, and then all of a sudden you get this image or something comes nagging. You know, I've heard people attribute that to the devil. Maybe that's right. Comes along and just brings up, you know, throws your past back in your face at <laughs> inopportune times when things are going really well, and it threatens to just throw you right off, right? I think that happened to Paul some. Evidently, that even happened when he was writing Holy Scripture. He was still nagged by some of that baggage. Well, in looking at the baggage we carry around from the past, you know, I was wondering about maybe what that baggage might look like. And so I looked at a few things. One, one maybe would be failure. How about failure? Anybody, anybody here ever have to lug around the baggage of past failures? My guess is, in fact, it's more than a guess, I'm pretty positive that all of us in here have failed at something. Uh, sometimes we have little failures and sometimes they're big failures. The little failures we try to forget, you know, everybody gets an F on their report card at some point in elementary school, don't they? I mean, I don't, oh, well, I thought they did, I, I did, and, uh, uh, you know, but, but there, are other, there are other failures in our life that certainly do hold us back, and uh, other failures that, that are harder to get over. I, 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 I've thought about three things that important people have told me in times of failure in my life that really did help me continue and keep moving forward. And I wanted to just share them with you briefly. One thing someone told me one time, that failing at something does not make you a failure. That's true. Never forget that. Failing at something does not make you a failure. Will you tell your neighbor that? They need to remember that. Failing at something does not make you a failure. Remember that. Never forget that. Because that's the problem. Failure is a normal part of life where it gets dangerous and where it becomes damaging is when you believe the lie of the devil that because you failed at something, your identity is now a failure. And that's not true. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You're a child of God. That's your identity. You belong to Jesus Christ. But even Christians occasionally fail at something. Woody Davis, the chair of evangelism, uh, teacher of evangelism in our conference one uh, several years ago, taught me something else. When in the church, we were looking at stepping out in faith and trying something new in the church, and I was getting a, a considerable amount of resistance from that, you know, from the church, and it kind of amazed me because I had people that had no trouble, you know, stepping out in faith in, in their families and, and in their own businesses, and they were people filled with faith. But when it came to the, you know, the church stepping out in faith, they became very, very conservative very, very fast because nobody wants to let God down. And when the church is looking at taking a little risk, when the church is looking at stepping forward in faith and doing something differently than they've always done it, what we think in our brain is that, oh boy, stakes for this are really high. 
Because I sure don't want to be the one that kills the church. I sure don't want to be the one that lets God down. And so suddenly we clam up. Woody said this to me. I've never forgotten it. He said, give yourself permission to fail. Somebody needs to hear that. Tell your neighbor that. Give yourself permission to fail. And that's important. Give yourself permission to fail. Failing doesn't make you a failure. He, he followed that up with a third statement that I've never forgotten, and I always do better when I remember this. He said, if you aren't failing occasionally, you aren't trying enough new things. I think that's true. You know, uh, I, our confirmands went, and I didn't get to go yesterday. They went bowling and did some new things, did some, went to some ministries that they had not been to before and tried some new things. And I think as parents and as mentors in the church, we love introducing young people to new things. And when they're hesitant to try something new, we say, hey, go ahead, give it a try, even if you fail. Because we know that that young person will be handicapped later in life if they clam up every time they have a chance to do something new right? That's true. Give yourself permission to fail. And if you're not failing often, you're probably not trying enough new things. Tell your neighbor that if you're not failing often, you may not be trying enough new things. That's true. Failure. How about the past? Baggage of the past. How about bad decisions? Anybody ever make a bad decision? I mean, (laughs) okay, thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one. It looks like maybe 30% of us are honest. Okay, thank you. Uh, Someone told me one time that much of your life is, your life is the way it is because of five or six key decisions you've made in your life. Isn't that interesting? Think about the five or six key decisions that you've made in your life. Maybe some of them good, some of them bad. If you've got some of those key decisions that took you in a path you did not want to go, here's the great news. If you can hear my voice, you're still alive. (laughs) And you can still make decisions. And from this point forward, you can make good decisions instead of bad decisions. Isn't that great news? We have a God who empowers us to make decisions. And whatever bad decisions we may have made in our past, We now have the opportunity to make good decisions from this day forward, and that's great news. Third, sometimes we carry around baggage from the past that's it's hurt from something we couldn't control. Sometimes, you know, the past, the the baggage that we lug around has nothing to do with some bad decision we made or even something. Something happened to us by somebody else maybe, or maybe just circumstances align themselves, whatever. You know, we didn't really have any control over it. You know, the Apostle Paul faced that back during his ministry. He had something he refers to as a thorn in his flesh. The Greek word would be more like tent stake in his flesh. Something really painful for him, right? He said it's a thorn in his side. Nobody knows what that meant. Nobody knows if Paul is referring to an actual physical ailment like appendicitis or maybe he had a gall, bad gallbladder. No, nobody knows exactly what that was. I've heard people conjecture that the, that the thorn in his side was a bad marriage. I don't know. I've heard people say maybe it was because he was going blind. We do know he was going blind towards the end of his, his life. And as someone who was writing over half the New Testament, that was kind of a burden, right? But we don't know what it was. But we know it was something you couldn't control. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and some of you need to go back and read that this afternoon. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he prays a prayer that God would deliver him from that thing, whatever it was. But guess what? God never did that. Apparently, if that, if that prayer was ever answered the way Paul hoped it would be answered, we don't, we'd never hear about it again. His answer to Paul <clears throat> excuse me, is fascinating. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul's miracle was not the changing of his circumstances, Paul's miracle was not the the, the changing of his predicament. Paul's miracle was the ability to live victoriously and gracefully in spite of whatever this thing was that was tormenting him the way it was. That's amazing to me. Because if anybody had seen miracles take place, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, if you believe half the stuff of the New Testament, he'd seen all kinds of miracles for other people. And yet when he prayed for his own, the miracle he got was the sufficiency of God's grace. 
to live victoriously and well in spite of the fact that that circumstance did not change. But by anybody's estimation, the Apostle Paul lived a victorious life. God used him to write over half the New Testament. He planted churches. He was the church's greatest missionary ever. You and I are here today 2,000 years ago, later because of him. And yet there was something in his life that remained, I guess, until he died. And yet he was given grace to live victoriously in spite of it. Well, fifth, when I think about baggage that we sometimes carry around, and finally, some of the baggage we carry around is a result of the person that we used to be. Jesus said, you know, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why our words are so important. They're a reflection of what's going on inside of us. Before you came to Christ, we learned last week in Ephesians chapter 2, you were a child of wrath, hell bound, just like everybody else. You've got this new identity now in Christ. But here's the thing. We're going to live the rest of our life. We're going we're to live out the rest of our lives trying to live into that new identity. But some of us are trying to outlive the old identity. You know, it's true. Sometimes before you can learn something new, you have to unlearn some of the old stuff. This morning, may I encourage you with 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says very, very, in a very straightforward way, if anyone is in Christ, let's just read it together. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Think about that. Isn't that the gospel? Isn't that the story of Easter? That God took the worst thing that ever happened and turned it into the best thing. That's true. Nothing could be worse than, I mean, there's been a lot of horrible, horrible things that have happened through history. But think about the, the horrible thing that happened to Jesus. God visited the planet. God loved us so much that he came in person to planet Earth and we killed him. Doesn't get worse than that. God took the worst thing that ever happened and turned it into the best thing that ever happened on the third day when Christ rose again and won not only for himself a victory over hell and death, but for all those with faith in him. Friends, that's the, the, the miracle of the resurrection and the good news of Easter for us still today. I have friends here this morning, we have friends here this morning from his house uh, involved with his house ministries, and uh, they uh, were willing to come and share with us in a, in, a, in a fun and unique way some of the ways that they have found new life in Christ. Uh, the Bible says that we should encourage one another. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And we have friends this morning that are willing to say so. And so I'm going to invite them to come now.
Gracious God, thank you for your love and grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that the power of your Holy Spirit is present this morning to free us from a painful past. God, if there is one here this morning that has hesitated to lay down that baggage at your feet, perhaps this is the day. Lord, forgive us. Free us, God, to let go and move forward in life.